Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God and Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Well, uh, it's wonderful for me to be here with you at Higher Things here in Colorado. My name is Jeremy Jacoby. I'm a pastor uh, in Thornton, Colorado, a church called Summit of Peace. Our bells are uh, up here, played for you guys as well. Uh, it's awesome to have you here from, it looks like, all over the country. What I'm most curious about, though, is raise your hand if you are from Dunder Mifflin Lutheran Church in Scranton. Just one of you is here? Interesting. Okay, well, good. Awesome. Uh, just so you know, our bells are provided by uh, Shroop Farms. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, today we get to at least wrestle with a question, but it's not a question that we usually deal with. I don't know about you, but in my day-to-day -day life, I'll get asked lots of different questions. A question might be something like, what is your name? What is your favorite color? What is your quest? Any of you uh, run across these questions on a daily basis? Well, yeah. So when we read our text for today from Matthew and that which is taking place with Jesus and the disciples, he has a different kind of question for them. He wants to know who the people say he is. And the context for this is, is kind of interesting because Matthew has been showing that there's actually different opinions, different ideas about who Jesus is who this person is that has stepped onto the scene, this rabbi who's sort of challenged what's been taking place, that, that sort of challenged the status quo, and, and questions now remain. And in fact, just prior to this, the Pharisees have come. They've had their own questions of Jesus, and they, of course, demanded to, to know and to see a sign. Uh, Jesus' answer to them is not quite so gracious and nice. He says that they don't deserve a sign. They, they are approaching him not as uh, a people who are generally have a question coming in, in uh, humility, but they come to test him. But to be honest, and to fa fair to the Pharisees, John the Baptist himself wasn't sure. Back in chapter 11, John sent his own disciples to Jesus to say, are, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect another? Because the thing about Jesus is, he was not what anyone had expected. And so when the disciples are, are traveling here at this time, Jesus says, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? And, and to be fair, it's a pretty good answer, isn't it? Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. I don't know about you guys, but if I was ever mistaken for one of those, I'd be, feel like I was in good company, right? But for Jesus, this is, is not quite enough. He wants to know uh, the deeper question, and that is, who do they say he is? And that's actually a question that God's people should wrestle with throughout their lives, throughout their walk with him, it is the question of who do we believe Jesus to be? And to be honest, if we're fair, we probably struggle and, and swing in our answers, or at least in the way we respond between the Pharisees and, and John the Baptist to the disciples. There's times in our life when we feel like God owes us a sign, when, when we've had enough, when, when the, the trials and tribulations of the day have been too much, when, when COVID has lasted too long, when Zoom school has gone on for too long, when we feel isolated and cut off and, and our desire is to have God intervene and do something miraculous at that moment. It's not uncommon for God's people to, to struggle with those times and, and to demand a sign. It's not uncommon for them to, to wonder what God's doing. Is he really about the things we think he should be about? We can have questions like John the Baptist does and say, are you the one? Or should we expect another? But the answer that Peter gives is, of course, the best one. Simon Peter replies, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And this answer, of course, is the answer. It's the, the proclamation of the church. It is the proclamation of God's people throughout time. That this one who has come into this world is, in fact, the Messiah. The one that God has sent to rescue, to redeem, to make whole. 
I mean, think about this. This is like one of the few times that Peter doesn't stick his foot in his mouth. It's kind of amazing, isn't it? And, and Jesus recognizes it too. So he says, blessed are you, Simon, because you didn't come up with this on your own. That had to be from God. I tell you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. This confession, this acknowledgement that Christ is, in fact, the answer. That, that even in our times of darkest despair, those moments when we believe that, that God cannot overlook our sin, that he cannot see us through this moment, the, the confession of Christ is, in fact, the answer. It is the rock. And to me, it leads to something that I think is very, very important, but oftentimes misunderstood. And in fact, for many years, I misunderstood this myself. Jesus says, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And for whatever reason, in my mind, I always pictured the church as this big, strong castle. And here are the walls and the, and the gates that are they're under siege by the enemy. But do you notice it's exactly the opposite? What Jesus says is the gates of hell, the gates of the enemy, are what are under siege from the church and its confession of Christ. We, as part of the kingdom of heaven, are not on the defensive, we are on the offensive. What Christ has done for each and every one of us grabbing us and pulling us out of the kingdom of the enemy and placing us in the kingdom of his heavenly father. That is what the church is about forever. That which began actually when God spoke his name upon you in the waters of baptism. At that moment, he said, you are removed from the kingdom of darkness and you are now part of the kingdom of light. And that this confession that we make, that this one man, this God, this Messiah, is the answer, causes the gates of hell to fall. And our task is to continue to be on the offensive. Now, this is not to say that we will not have our struggles. That does not mean that the enemy does not still attack us, for he does. Even and perhaps especially in our Christian walk, we will find ourselves back in those times of wondering. Back in those times of questions, wrestling with whether or not this is really what God has in mind for us. But to me, the uh, amazing thing that Jesus said to John the Baptist has to remain for us as well. Back in chapter 11, when, when questioned about whether Jesus was the Messiah, he said, Go and tell John what you've heard and seen. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. What Jesus is basically saying is the effects of sin in this world are reversed as the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, as its reign begins to take over this world. And it begins with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it rolls out from there. But Jesus even gives us this assurance of how it is applied to us in the next verse. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. We have fancy ways of talking about this in the church. We talk about it as the office of the keys. But the, what it comes down to is basically this. That when you have your sins forgiven, they are forgiven. When you have your confession, have made your confession in church, when you have acknowledged your sins before God, before one another, before your pastor, and those words of forgiveness have spoken to you, that is a absolute and total guaranteed thing in heaven. Your sins are forgiven, they are gone, they are removed from you forever. And that which enlivens us, those words of forgiveness that enliven us are what lead us then as the church. One last thing I would say about this is the last verse, which is he tells the disciples strictly 
to tell no one that he is the Christ. We could spend a long time on why he does this, but I just want to point out one thing. That doesn't apply anymore. Sometimes uh, among Christians and maybe along, among Lutherans, we still uh, operate and behave this way as if we, we are afraid or, or um, nervous about telling people that Jesus is the Christ. But the greatest message that we have now is this truth, that he is the Christ. He is the answer to our sin, our death, all that plagues us. And we rejoice that God has not only rescued us from the kingdom of the enemy and placed us in the kingdom of heaven. But we are part of his church. And hell's gates will not stand against it. Amen.